Hello everybody, I'm John Brewer and this is Large Ship Combat 101. This week on Large Ship Combat 101, we're going to talk about damage control. No matter how well you design or fly your ship, it will eventually take damage. How well the crew is prepared and how they react to damage is often critical to the outcome of an engagement. Damage control preparations begin when a ship is designed, but for this episode, we'll only be covering planning and executing a damage control plan on an already designed ship. To begin, let's cover some types of damage that ships incur. The first type is superficial damage. Superficial damage is deformation or destruction of blocks that don't directly contribute to the functioning of the ship. For example, armor damage is usually superficial, as is damage to galleries, corridors, quarters, or other areas of the ship that don't contain critical systems. The second type of damage is degrading damage. This is damage which reduces the ship's capabilities, but don't remove that capability entirely. For example, a hit that disables or destroys some of the rocket launchers in a bank would be degrading damage. The third type of damage is disabling damage. Disabling damage removes a capability the ship had before the hit. The classic example of a disabling shot is the destruction of a ship's power system, rendering all engines, weapon systems, and other power drawing components disabled. The fourth and final type of damage we'll be discussing is shock damage. Shock damage is damage that reduces or disables a ship's capabilities, but is practical to repair or bypass quickly to regain some or all of the lost capability. An example of shock damage would be the destruction of the bridge of a warship in creative mode, forcing the pilot to relocate to an alternate control station. During the pilot's movement in their ship, the vessel would lose its ability to maneuver, but it would regain it as soon as the pilot reached the backup control chair. Much of the preparation for damage control comes from planning how to convert degrading and disabling damage into shock damage, and then reducing the time it takes to recover from that shock damage. There are many, many techniques and methods available to plan for damage control, so today we're just going to cover two, crew redeployment and power redistribution. Hits to the crew compartment, whether it is an exposed bridge or a combat information center buried deep in the ship, require special measures to recover from. In creative, the crew themselves will survive the damage, although they may be flung from the spacecraft. To regain control of the ship, they'll need to reach another control area. In creative, this can be as easy as placing down a new control chair, entering it, and continuing. In survival, though, the crew in the affected location will often be killed or injured. Both the survivors and those respawning at an onboard medical bay will need to reach alternate control chairs. While the crew is moving around the ship, it is often in their best interest for the ship to stop accelerating. Ships under acceleration in Space Engineers often present serious difficulties to crew members attempting to move about the vessel. If the pilot was affected by the hit, the ship may have stopped by itself, or it may be still driven by gravity drives or overridden thrusters. In the latter case, the first crew person to reach a panel on board should disable the ship's drive. Having an emergency stop group set greatly helps with this process the pilot can reactivate the drive when they reach a control chair. The second case we'll cover is having a power underflow. Most warships protect their generators very heavily, but the devastating effect of a power loss makes them prime targets for enemy fire. Ships that use a distributed power generation system by putting generators in various places around the ship are more likely to suffer partial power loss. If power demand ever exceeds power generation, most systems will immediately go offline. The exception is propulsion and gyroscopic attitude control, usually the largest draw on a warship. These systems reduce their power draw and output proportional to the fraction of their desired draw available. There are two ways to compensate for the loss of a reactor, to provide replacement power or to reduce the power draw. Charged batteries can be used to provide temporary power to a ship, but it's important to remember that their maximum discharge rate is only 4 megawatts so two are needed to replace a small reactor, and 25 for a large reactor. Putting your batteries in a group for rapid toggling is important. Finally, if the ship enters a situation where the reactors can't power everything, it is usually best to begin shutting down systems. Think through the order in which you'd prefer your systems to go offline, and then put them into numbered groups of related components. For example, shutting down half the gravity generators in the gravity shield will reduce its effectiveness by 50%, but it may still deflect incoming fire. Likewise, artificial masses used in gravity drives draw 600 kilowatts each while active. Turning off some fraction of them keeps the ship in motion 
but frees up a lot of power. Finally, antennas set to very long ranges draw enormous power. Reducing their range to what is needed for the current engagement may free up considerable power. Again, before entering combat, make decisions on how important to combat each system on board is. Create groups that allow you to augment power or deactivate systems in a methodical way when you have time to think about it. During combat, just execute your plan for toggling systems on and off in order to maintain combat readiness. Proper damage control processes can keep a ship in the fight long after a less prepared crew would have lost the engagement. Come back next week for our final episode of Large Ship Combat 101. Until then, I'm John Brewer. Come and learn from my mistakes.